as a believer, we are told that we need to walk in forgiveness. And so even though you don't have the feelings to back that up, you step out in faith and say, I, I forgive, I choose to forgive. The thing that really helped me to want to enter into that peace of forgiveness was Rachel would have been the first to forgive those boys. And I knew that. I was now a voice for her to represent who Rachel was and everything that was in her little heart and spirit. I needed to walk in that forgiveness. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. There are times that darkness comes to our lives in ways that drive us to do things that we never thought we were capable of. Sometimes those actions devastate others in addition to ourselves. Our guests today have been victims to times of darkness, both the darkness within one's own heart and the darkness that spills out when an act of shame, cowardice, and desperation impacts more than just yourself. Beth Nemo and TJ Stevens. Beth Nemo is mother to Rachel Joy Scott, a victim of the Columbine school shootings in 1999. A spiritual person, Rachel brought joy and life to those around her. Since her death and the death of 12 others that day, in honor of her, Beth has committed her life to helping other kids understand where the darkness of neglect, abuse, low self-worth, and a myriad of other issues seep into their way of thinking and helps them steer clear from actions that could have had a devastating impact. TJ Stevens has a ministry in Nashville that helps give back to the community by raising money for various causes through concert events. But he was a very troubled teen due to a traumatic home life and abuse perpetrated by a stepfather. TJ describes a moment when darkness had pushed him to the point of thinking his life had no meaning and brought him to the brink of harming himself and others. And then how he felt the hope of being given another choice, the choice to do the right thing. TJ and Beth first met while recording an interview for I Am Second. Since that time, their paths have crossed often to encourage each other as they encourage others to overcome the darkness in their own lives. I'm Beth Nemo. I am the mother of Rachel Joyce Scott. She was the first victim killed at the Columbine High School shooting in April 20th of 1999. Rachel was the middle of my five children. And um, there was always something very special about her. She attracted people. <laughs> I know. There was just a charisma about her from the beginning of her life. And at 12, she became spirit-filled, and it transformed her purpose and her destiny. She became very aggressive in her desire to be a witness for the Lord and to her peers and befriend and reach out to the broken and the left out people around her. And God just used her in a powerful way. So she left a positive influence as well as the writings and the drawings that corresponded with her faith walk. We started seeing what God had been doing behind the scenes in her life with her writings and the prophetic element that was there where she prophesied her own death. And all of a sudden, it wasn't about the shooters anymore. It was about God's purposes. The shooters were instruments of devastation that day, and the two shooters obviously bought into the lie that life wasn't important, they didn't have any value, and they wanted to go out in a blaze of glory. You know, uh, for the boys, they, they ended up in the same box that the other 13 victims ended up in. You know what I'm saying? There was nothing redemptive for them out of, out of that. And I think if teenagers especially can see that that path, that destructive mindset, that they allow themselves to go down or they're encouraged to go down because of the input that they've had through, through the media, through friends, even through family. Once they discern that that's, that's not real, you know, uh, once they can see past the fantasy of that, then, um, then they had the ability and the capacity to make a better choice. I'm TJ Stevens. From the time I was a baby, my mom and dad divorced. So I never knew a real relationship in that aspect. Up to the age of seven, uh, my mom was working two jobs, sometimes three jobs. 
And financially, she was just struggling to try to raise me and my brother at the time. And when I turned seven, she remarried. And uh, it was supposed to be a new, great thing in our life. And it became the worst thing that ever happened to me. He wasn't abusive at first. Um, It took about a year or so before he started getting comfortable. And uh, he was an alcoholic. And um, I saw many beatings. I endured many beatings, and I listened to my mom be beat um, from the floor above, and doors being kicked in, and just a nightmare situation of fear. I ran away from home several times. Um, I was afraid to tell people why. I tried to commit suicide about three times. Um, No one ever knew that. And I even wrote out suicide notes and everything. And and then I remember running back, trying to find them, to tear them up before anybody found them. Um, but there's a, there's this a cycle there, right? There's there's a lot of red flags in my life that no one ever saw. Uh, that that it wasn't so much as being ashamed as it was being in, in fear. So as a child, you try to cope with it and understand it, and you never tell your teachers, you never tell your your friends. Um, because if it ever gets back to them, um, it would be bad. Um, what we give focus to, we give strength to. And I gave focus to nothing but darkness. And darkness was filled me to a point where there was, it was an abyss of nowhere to turn. I actually have the gun in my mouth in front of school faculty getting ready to commit suicide on my knees with a rifle in my mouth and the butt of the gun on the ground. It was over. I mean, there was no turning back. If you're locked in a dark room, you don't see anything but darkness. There's no light coming through. There's there's nothing. You're enveloped in the darkness, which is exactly what the enemy wants, especially for this generation of young people. It's like the enemy's platform is grown, and it's not just one thing that contributes to this. When I do school programs, I'm not doing those now, but when I did for many years, I dealt with the issues of the heart. And I know TJ can speak to this as well. When the heart isn't changed, even if you have modified behavior and there's a certain amount of control there, eventually what's in the heart will manifest itself and surface. And so our focus is more about what's going on in the heart. You know, what is causing the anger, what's causing the rejection, what's causing the isolation. And even popular kids can experience those emotions. And then the cowardice comes in. The cowardice is almost like uh, you don't care. You don't care about others. But but then there was God. And when he intervenes, he puts his fist down. And when he does, if you listen, if you will listen to his voice, if you listen to his calling, if you listen to what he has for you, and he will give you that option, even to the point of death, he's there with you. I mean... It's never too late to turn around and do the right thing. I was given that opportunity to see 100-foot waves in the middle of an ocean and know the boat's going down, okay? You know it's going down. And all of a sudden, you're sitting on a golden pond. You're speechless. You're trying to understand. You're crying inside, but at the same time, you're praising inside something you don't even know exists, something greater than yourself loves you. There was a lot of prayers going on in that school, outside the school. So it was a a lot of prayer happening. This was not TJ. This was God's hand and the power of prayer from teachers, family, friends, because they knew who I was, and they knew I wasn't this person that was inside that school. There was spiritual intervention for him and, and how much I wished that the shooters of Columbine would have experienced that and would have been open to it. You know, TJ had to make a choice whether to fire the gun or not. It was still his choice, and he chose well. 
He chose not to. And I guess when I look at kids now that um, there's been so many shooters, there's a very familiar pattern there of the road that they're walking down. First of all, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So he takes away any hope for their life. That's the first thing he has to do is life has no value, especially mine. You know, like TJ said, he was a dead man walking. And so he didn't feel like, what's the point of living? <laughs> you know, uh, there's nothing here for me to live for. And so I think hearing TJ's story, it gives me insight for one thing, how the enemy works in the mind and the heart of a young person. TJ helped me understand the dark mindset. Your mind has to be completely shut off to any words of life or hope. And thankfully, even when TJ wanted to act on how he felt and what he wanted to do, the Lord gave him hope. Beth, you encouraged me in ways that you I can tell you that God used you, and uh, in doing that, He's showing great and mighty things and the results from all sides in my life now. And people like Beth, for me, is a divine appointment that I'm very grateful for. And I will take her name and her word and her wisdom and her love and her forgiveness, I'll take it to my grave. TJ chose well. He chose to listen. And he chose to, to walk away from everything the enemy had planned for that day, which was to take not only his life, but lives of others. And I think one of the things that we have a responsibility to the next generation coming up is we have to show them what you're in right now doesn't have to be your life sentence and it doesn't have to define the rest of your life. I think when you're at your darkest point, you need life. And the Word brings life. No matter where you're at or what's going on, the Word brings life to a situation, brings answers to a situation. It brings peace to a situation. There's so many elements that God's love encompasses all of it. Wherever our need is, the Word meets you at that point on a daily basis or minute by minute basis for some of us. It's the word that keeps that balance. It's the word that keeps us grounded. And there's times when I just need that. I need to feel his love and his presence. You know, I know it's there. My mind knows it, but sometimes I need to experience it. I've got several copies of Jesus Calling. <laughs> I picked it up years ago as just a little devotional and I just found that it resonates so many times in what's going on at that moment in my life. It just It's just a faithful reminder how much God loves us and how much He can redeem any situation or how much He can restore a situation and how much He's the answer to every situation. I think it's on point with where people are in their daily walk and how they need just little words of encouragement. You don't have to have a whole sermon to walk away with life-giving words. So this is Jesus Calling, September 23rd. It says, Walk with me in the freedom of forgiveness. The path we follow together is sometimes steep and slippery. If you carry a burden of guilt on your back, you are more likely to stumble and fall. At your request, I will remove the heavy load from you and bury it at the foot of the cross. When I unburden you, you are undeniably free. Stand up straight and tall in my presence so that no one can place more burdens on your back. Look into my face and feel the warmth of my love light shining upon you. It is this unconditional love that frees you from both fears and sins. Spend time basking in the light of my presence as you come to know me more and more intimately. You grow increasingly free. God's word is a living thing. It's a living word. And when Jesus came to this earth, it became flesh. It's like this right here to me is a special friend speaking to me straight to my heart as Beth did it and speaking to me ways that I can understand and consume. I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful in, in my situation that, that God did give me 
an option. And I'm thankful now that he's allowing me to serve him in ways that I would have never dreamed of. I'm so thankful you've been redeemed and restored and given new life and new chances and a new way to live life and love the Lord. I think Rachel herself gave us the courage to move forward. And she left such a platform of redemption that um, it would have been complete disobedience for us to crawl into a shell and be bitter, unforgiving, and just hide our pain. I think even as believers, we're almost afraid to say, I forgive, because we think it's a pass for what happened. And I think when we view forgiveness more from a point of, I want to be redeemed from this. I want to be restored from this. And hopefully the abuser or the perpetrator would also experience that. But we're not responsible for them. I'm able to forgive because I'm not making that a life sentence. It was for Rachel. What happened that day was a life sentence. We don't get overs on that. It's giving yourself permission to move forward and let the Lord heal the pain. To learn more about TJ and Beth's stories, be sure to check out their I Am Second talk at IamSecond.com. If you or someone you know has been dealing with thoughts of suicide, there is help. Please call the National Suicide Prevention Line at one 800 273 8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. If you'd like to hear more stories about forgiveness and trusting God in times of darkness, check out our interview with Lisa Turkhurst. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with writer and wife of country music star Thomas Rhett. Lauren Akins opens up about her lifelong friendship with Thomas and the life-changing experience of doing mission work in Haiti, and then in Uganda, where she met the precious baby who would become their first daughter a year later. So I went with complete strangers to a third world country while my husband was releasing an album and doing all kinds of things stateside. But I just felt like it was a door that the Lord had swung wide open right in front of me and it turned out to be the best the best thing I'd ever done because it's like God just opened my eyes to a whole new world and I felt like at least in that moment he introduced me to my purpose then Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Jesus Calling Book, on Facebook, and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.